White. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this has been absolutely crazy. Uh, last week, a week ago, Denise called me and said, have you been thinking about what school's gonna look like when it opens? And to be honest, it was, I think, like the day after Memorial Day, it was the last thing on my mind, but having a senior who's graduating and seeing what that whole process looked like, it got me to start thinking. And Denise has triplets who are rising seniors, so it's big time on her mind. Um, and Denise and I, both knew Patricia Zaccaro and knew that she had put out a survey recently about what people were thinking. So unbeknownst to us, um, we started a Facebook group and I guess it was a hot button for a lot of you guys. Mm. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the respect you guys have shown in the, in the, the group. Um, it's taken off. There's 3,500 members. Um, and I will reiterate the reason we started this is I'll get it right out there. Denise lives in Norwalk and she's a Republican. I live in Wilton. I'm a Democrat and our girls are the best of friends as are we. So this has nothing to do with politics. This has to do with us being parents and caring about what's going on with our kids. Um, I have a public relations background. So my feeling was the most important thing was for clear communication from the state and from our districts. But secondly, it was about us being heard because What's disappointing to us is that there's not a lot of representation from teachers or principals or school psychologists who are making the decisions, let alone parents. <clears throat> um, so that's why we started this. And I'm going to turn it over to Denise to introduce herself. Well, hi, everybody. As Allison <laughs> said, my name is Denise Perna. I live in Norwalk and I have um, soon to be 17 year old triplets that will be starting their senior year at Norwalk High School. Um, and as Allison said, I have become increasingly concerned about uh, the lack of transparency coming out of Hartford. Um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, seeing how everything has been handled, I just figured that school was going to be kind of handled the same way. And it seems that it's I think secrecy may be a strong word, but there's definitely not a lot of communication. Um, the concerns I had were that when I started to look at this task force of how we're going to reopen, um, I didn't really see any of you know the uh, local leaders on there. I didn't see any elected officials at all, and it, it kind of um, you know made me take a little pause and think. Well, you know what? We really need to, as parents, get ahead of this and start planning now because I, I really feel strongly that being that these are our children going into school, that we should have some type of input as to what this is gonna look like. And when I saw the list of CDC guidelines, it actually, it, it scared me both from a mental health standpoint and also a, a fiscal standpoint, really, because I just couldn't imagine like how in the world, you know, the budgets would allow for this type of implementation. And so I thought, you know what, we need to just, you know, kind of maybe form some type of groups where we could have our voices heard and maybe have some type of impact on how it's going to look in September for us. So Patricia reached out to us and, and it's not great enough for us to just talk amongst ourselves. And that was one of the things we promised. We are not going to talk amongst ourselves. We are going to be heard. And Patricia said, hey, how about I get somebody who can get our voices heard to come on a call? And we said, great. Um, so just some homework um, or some housekeeping. Derek Stanley is a name you'll see up there. Derek is the host. Derek is going to mute and unmute people to allow them to not, so, so Kathleen doesn't want to hear questions. She wants to hear comments so she can take those comments back to Hartford. So as the opposite of Jeopardy, please put it as a comment, not a question. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Patricia now. And Patricia, maybe you can introduce yourself a little too for those of you people who don't know you. Yes. Hi. Um, good evening. I'm Patricia Zuccaro. And um, just a little bit about me. I'm, I'm running for state representative of the 143rd. Um, and I, I, before I start about that, I do want to thank Allison and Denise for all their hard work in organizing this event. It's been um, a, lo a long time coming, I think, um, and very difficult. Thank you. 
Um, so a few weeks ago, I was very concerned that parents were not being heard um, when it came to Governor Lamont's task force. And so I posted a survey on Facebook to sort of get a vibe for what others were feeling about that. Um, and Allison and Denise uh, created that Facebook group called School oh. Reopening, Our Voice Must Be Heard. And shortly after um, creating that group, I spoke with them and we talked about whether there was any context at the state level and if I would be able to help provide a better understanding of what the plan would look like for fall. Um, and while the state has not released any information regarding a specific plan for fall, I was able to get my friend Kathleen to participate in this Zoom call. Uh, Representative Kathleen McCarty, who represents Waterford in the State House, is the ranking member of the Education Committee in the State General Assembly. So I'll turn it over to Kathleen, who will be able to um, take your comments and thoughts back to the state for us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. First, may I just say it's truly a privilege to be here with all of you this evening. And I would like to recognize uh, Patricia and thank her for the invitation, because as you heard in Denise's remark and Allison, that it is really important to hear from our parents and to have parental engagement and how reopening the schools will look in the fall. So I can tell you that you are really the first and a very important uh, forum to bring back your suggestions, your opinions to the State House. I'm uh, happy to have a voice being the ranking member of education in the assembly, and I will look forward to hearing all of your comments tonight. I can tell you that at this stage, uh, the guidelines are being driven by the CDC guidelines, which you just heard mentioned a few moments ago, but there is flexibility as this pandemic continues to change. So your suggestions, what you feel as parents, how you see and envision the opening, various scenarios at place, I think are gonna be, it's gonna be an important part that I know the State Department of Education, the Education Committee, and all those stakeholders that work with looking at what we're gonna, how the schools will look in, in the fall will be important to hear what you have to say tonight. So again, uh, a little background. I do have a connection to Wilton. I was a world language teacher years ago at Wilton High School. And I know that the parents in your area are very engaged and it's uh, really wonderful that you've taken this initiative to listen and to talk to each other and to really help us form the appropriate plans going forward. So my uh, pledge to you tonight is to listen attentively to you and to bring back uh, your voices to Hartford. So again, thank you very much. And this is being recorded. So if anybody can't stay, we're gonna post it on the Facebook group and Kathleen, you don't have to worry about missing any points because it will be recorded for you. Great, thank you. So Derek, if you want to um, start going through, he'll text me names. The first comment will be from Amanda. Um, so Amanda will be, hi Amanda. So Derek, if you wanna let Amanda in. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, good evening. I, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who made this happen. I wasn't originally part of this group and I was, um, I was able to participate and I'm very grateful um, uh, to be able to participate. And I'm also feel uh, very good inside that there are other parents who are as concerned as I am. So I'm, I'm sure many people wanna speak, so I'm just gonna cut to the chase. Um, the three comments that I, I sent, not questions are, um, one, uh, I feel that I've reviewed, I happen to be an adult physician. I'm not a pediatrician, so please take this with a grain of salt. But um, the children have been relatively spared severe illness, and there's actually no good data to support the fact that they're actual vectors for disease. There is no literature that supports that, either nature or any of the science or literature coming out of Europe. And so um, I think school needs to be back in order for a myriad of reasons. One, because there's no good data that they're vectors. Two, our children are not getting uh, severely ill and uh, they are emotionally, physically, and academically suffering due to the closure. Um, 
I think that they've been ignored and marginalized as well as families. I think parents need to go back to work who, uh, you know, have been unable to do so and people have been unable to care, um, you know, both for their homework or their spouse situation. I'm sure that child obesity is going up because they're at home overeating and not exercising and playing video games and their minds are, uh, you know, really not being challenged. My children are in elementary school and I can tell you that it's been a very big challenge for the, you know, uh, just speaking at, at my level with my age of children to function on a screen, to type and text, it has been worthless. This has been a futile effort to educate our children. I know there wasn't really much else of an option, but I can say at least for the younger tier that cannot independently self-motivate or learn on a screen, this, I can say that my children really um, did not learn too much here. And as a, as a sidebar, probably an un, unpopular, maybe non-medical comment, as a taxpayer, I am concerned that we are maintaining a defunct school system with an idle workforce. And this is really unjust for the taxpayer. I don't know what happened in other towns. I can only speak to what happened in our town, but the children had no face-to-face -face time in Greenwich in the public schools with their teachers until a mandate came at like the middle of May when they had to increase the amount of time that the children participated in face-to-face -face or meaningful uh, interaction with their teachers for an additional half hour or so. And, um, you know, it's, um, I, I, it's, it's very upsetting and, I, and I'm very concerned uh, for, you know, my daughter who's transitioning to the middle school, and I'm sure there are people who are concerned about transitioning to other stages in their life, that they will not be academically prepared, and emotionally and physically, uh, they have uh, suffered quite a bit. Amanda, thank you. Can you also just tell us where you're from, what your school district is? I'm sorry, Greenwich Public School Systems. Okay, and if, if everybody could just say what district they're from, that would be helpful. Um, okay, thank you, Amanda. The next one is Alicia Kennerson. Hello. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I have been so, so frustrated, as all of you have been with everything that's been going on. Um, I live in New Hartford. I have a senior who, you know, had to sit home and not have his senior prom and everything else that you're all aware of. Um, I'm also a selectman in my town and I totally disagree personally with doing any changes to the schools for the fall. Having said that, I understand that there's people that do have valid concerns and I think a lot of that has been driven by the media drilling this fear into us. Be that as it may, there are people that have real concerns for themselves and their children. And I think that any um, solution has to take all three factors into consideration, financial, mental health, and physical health, and the education aspect of it. As Amanda, um, you know, I love everything that Amanda said. You did an awesome job, Amanda, really identifying all the problems that are existing. Um, you know, there's just no good data out there to support the fact that these children, one of the concerns that people are having is they're saying, well, the children are asymptomatic carriers. There's no data to support that. There's no data to support that there are asymptomatic carriers. They just say that. I've been looking for the data. I have not found it. So there is, but there is a concern, and if they can take some modest steps in school, that would help with any flu season as well. I would be for that. I would be for, you know, more cleaning, um, but so, certainly not the social distancing, certainly not 10 kids in a classroom, certainly not 10 kids on a bus, certainly not masks, certainly not plexiglass, certainly not eating at your desk, certainly not no field trips either. All of that's got to get thrown out the window. But can we do a better job trying to keep them healthy? Yeah, I think we could do a better job. And I think that's got to be the compromise. And that if there are teachers that have a concern that they shouldn't be coming back um, and they want to do some long distance learning, 
then try to divert those teachers into those areas instead. I know people have mentioned that in our Facebook group, and I thought that was that was a good idea. Um, but the kids got to get back to normal. As Amanda has, again, has said everything about their mental health, their obesity, they're not being challenged. They got to get back to normal. We have done so much damage to our children that we can't measure it right now, but I'm sure I'm sure we're going to start measuring it soon, and we're going to see a lot of problems with that, with what we've done to them. Um, New Hartford just approved their budget last night. We are not only a local K through six education district, we have a regional district, um, seven to twelve, and the regional district had um, a, a pretty much a blank checkbook this year, and we have we had no recourse for holding them accountable for anything. And as you know, regional school districts, they, they frequently swing high and low between their member towns. And New Hartford was hit hard this year. So we struggled to um, pass a budget last night with the tax increase, with tripling our surplus that we typically, typically put in there from our rainy day fund. And this is just our regular expenses. I don't know what's going to happen next year if they all of a sudden say, you know what, you got to spend another 500000 for each school district just to have the busing. That will bankrupt this town. So that is a big, big concern for these towns. You have a financial concern with the, the extra equipment and inf infrastructure they want to put, us in, put in place. You've got a concern with the children and their mental health and their physical health and you've got a concern with educating them properly. Whatever plan you come up with has to address all three. And, and I don't want to upset anyone when I say, there are some parents out there that say, whatever it takes to educate our children, we must do. You have to take in all those, those factors. You have to take in the financial factor because you will bankrupt these towns. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for hearing us. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I'm sorry, I'm adding one more thing to it. If you could say what district you're from and also if there's been any communication about fall from your district, because that's one of the survey questions too. Um, the next person up is Carolina Corrigan. Hello. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Carolina Corrigan. I'm from the Wilton District. Uh, I do uh, sit on the reopening committee for our schools, for our middle school, Meadowbrook. Uh, we just had uh, our, one of our meetings today, and uh, I, I've, my biggest comment in the middle of the meeting today was, how is this plan, have, take, have they taken any account into these are children that we're talking about? We're talking about temperature screening, screening before these kids get there, temperature check. But, I mean, it's like a, a constant check. Are they gonna enter through tents? Uh, what are we gonna do if somebody runs to fever? I, you know, masks on. I mean, you're looking at the little population. My 14-year-old daughter had a mask on for an hour the other day, and all she did was pull it up and down her face. Uh, it's just not a sustainable uh, solution. And I would have to agree with Amanda and Alicia that, you know, th where is the actual data that our kids are petri dishes, as they call them, for this virus? And, and that's not minimizing others' concerns, but it's a real factor that we have to look at. Because right now, the way, and especially with the new ESY guidance coming out, there, it's almost like it was made for the school not to open because these are almost insurmountable. And now I'm listening for people and I would say that I'm in a considered a, a wealthy school district and we are looking at like, how are we financially going to do this? So I can imagine regionalized school districts and smaller districts or urban districts. I'm a child advocate in Bridgeport. I, mean, I don't even know how they would bus the kids to school, how are they gonna do this? These are not guidelines that are set for schools. These are guidelines that are set for businesses and adults. And um, so, oh, here I am. Oh, it's okay, Allison, you can keep yourself on I didn't it. do it, it's not me. 
I'm not driving the bus anymore. Derek is. Totally fine. But there has to be much more consideration into the children here. And, and that's my biggest issue. I don't have issue with them keeping them safe, keeping them, keeping the staff safe. We have a lot of uh, paraprofessional, uh, other staff in the school that falls into the, the elderly, the risk groups. Uh, there is definitely concern. I just don't see, like you were saying, busing, seven kids in a you know, 24 bus size. We were gonna need triple the buses and bus runs. Um, you know, what are we doing with all the other safety protocols in the school? How about safety drills? We're all learning to huddle up in a, in a corner of a, in a school room. How are we going to practice safety drills? Uh, fire drills. Okay, so if you can, if you're shutting off and you can only go one way in a corridor, what happens when it's a fire? I mean, these are like, main, like real safety concerns. And I'm afraid that the CDC guidelines and they, they are just not taking the children aspect into this account whatsoever. And that's really my count. So thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. Um, Amanda wanted to say there's been no communication from the Greenwich Public School District yet whatsoever. Um, I, I do, I know you didn't want questions, Kathleen, but this is something that I don't understand. And, and if everybody does, my apologies, but I was looking at the summer school issue today and, and there were guidelines that came down from the state about that. But I know some schools are, um, some districts are not doing any summer schools. Some are doing some. My, my question is, if and when the, the guidelines come down from Hartford, how much latitude does each school district have in implementing them, and I'll give you the example. If the if the guideline comes down that kids must be six feet apart, can a school district say we can't do that, so we're not going to have we're going to do all distance learning? I mean, is that a possibility? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd prefer not to make comment, but on this one, I I will. Uh, tell you that the guidelines just came out for opening summer school on July 6th and I think there is some latitude that's given to the uh, local districts on how they want to see that but they do need to follow the guidelines uh, with the distance social distancing at this stage and to uh, implement within certain amount of flexibility as to whether they come in school in person or they continue with the distance learning format. Those are all uh, part of those guidelines. But I think if they do come in, if the students come in in person right now, I don't think uh, they're allowed to just uh, burst with the social distancing. So I hope that answers your question. It also gives some flexibility to the superintendents if they think something is not working that they can shut down at a certain point. So there's latitude within the districts. You may not appreciate what I'm saying, but there is some latitude there, but um, there's also the guidelines. Thank you. And I will answer for Carolina because Carolina, I'm in Wilton too. We had excellent communications from our superintendent. It was a very detailed um, document that came out on Friday. So Wilton was great about that. Um, next up is Michelle. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, Derek, there's somebody saying they're waiting to be allowed in. Um, so I'm not sure, just giving you that technical. Michelle? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to, so I am a parent of two children in the Greenwich School District, and I, they're both elementary school aged, and I have seen firsthand how it is affecting them, and it is absolutely heartbreaking um, when it comes to anger and sadness. Um, my one son has clenched fist as he's doing his schoolwork, and it's a constant battle to get him motivated enough to do it. Um, with Common Core Math, 
being, you know, fairly challenging for me at myself while I'm working full time in order to help them. Um, I, what our district is doing is they've been just taking videos of lessons and having them, you know, the students watch the videos and then do the work that goes along with it. And it's completely, totally goes over their heads. First of all, if they're even motivated to watch it and actually retain, they're not having that interaction. I actually reached out to my son's teacher and asked for 15 minutes if she could just explain it to him. She did it twice in one week. I have to tell you, it was amazing. They need a teacher-student connection in order to educate. And things that go beyond just you know, traditional education, other life skills that happen in the classroom that are not happening here. Um, I worry for my children's mental health. I worry about obesity. Lately, I can't even get them out of the house. And again, I'm a full-time working parent um, with my husband who works full-time outside of the home. Um, like today, I was on a three-hour conference call and my children watched YouTube all day long. I, I, it kills me. It eats me. I feel like I'm doing a horrific job as a parent, but there's no other way that I could do this. Um, you know, what I would say, and I understand that people have concerns of, you know, people that are high risk in their homes. And I would say for those people, I completely understand, but then maybe there needs to be a choice where if you're in a high risk situation that you continue the homeschool. And for others, you know, they can send their children back to school. I think the bot at the end of the day, children need to be in a school environment for motivation, for mental health, for obesity, you know, echoing off everyone else's sentiments that have been said. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I'm here to say you're a great parent. Oh, thank you. You are a great parent. Everybody on here are wonderful parents. If you weren't, you wouldn't be on here right now. So don't ever doubt that. Thank you. Um, Jen Larkin is next. Hi, thanks for um, taking my, my comment. Um, I am, uh, I'm from Newtown. Um, we um, have not had much communication about what's going on. Um, there have, um, communication's actually been interesting. Um, I'm on communication overload. Um, I have two kids in elementary school, I have second and third grade. Um, they don't do much independently. Um, I'm also a full-time um, working uh, mom. I am home now, but I will, I will be asked to go back into the office at some point soon. Uh, my husband's a police officer, so he doesn't do that job from home. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, on, on the communication front, I get lots of communication. Some of them aren't as meaningful as I'd like, so I think I'm missing some of the ones that are. Um, my biggest concern um, is being a working mom. Um, and, you know, what do we do? We've, I, we have seen some models um, here in Newtown, uh, but you have to kind of go look for those models. Um, our Board of Education does have a Facebook page. So if you're a member or you choose to follow them, then you'll know um, some of the models that they're looking at, but nothing's been pushed out, um, you know, to everybody. Um, I can tell you none of those models work for me, um, but we'll make whatever they do work. Um, I've also taken a fairly substantial pay cut at work, um, and any of the models that they're proposing will cost me additional in child care uh, for my second and third graders, uh, well, they'll be third and fourth next year, who can't be left home alone. Um, I know that um, the government, federal and state, have um, subsidized lots of things in the past um, several months due to COVID. Um, I don't think working parents who are going to be impacted by additional child care costs um, should be expected to bear them on their own. Um, I would hope that um, as um, there have been considerations for small businesses, there have been considerations for folks who have lost their jobs entirely, um, that some of those considerations will be taken into um, account as well. Um, I will just also add um, on the parental guilt um, to the previous woman who spoke, you are not alone. Um, I struggle with, you know, doing, I can't be 100% of work, 100% of parenting. Um, and I've 
come to accept that with the help of some therapy. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it, it's hard. I think there's a, there's definitely been an e emotional impact on, on me too, I'll say, um, as well as my kids. Um, so I, I think I agree with almost everything I've heard so far in terms of the emotional and, and the mental. Um, and I will add that the instruction, I did see a good, a good um, post with lots of comments on, on, um, on it on the Facebook page. Instruction in Newtown, I'd say has been lackluster at best. Um, it took one of my children's classes um, much longer to get up and running in terms of the videos um, and anything um, really techy. Um, they were overriding the work in Google Classroom to the point where I said, you know what, let me just pick up a paper packet <laughs> and I'm going to resort to the old fashioned way. Um, I had one, one of my children's teacher did a really, really good job. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, instruction has been at the five minute video level with um, one class meet a week, which is, it's more of a play date, but it's, it's good that they get that, no complaints here. Um, but my daughter also receives intervention, and I will tell you that um, I think that's becoming an afterthought. Um, it's not being rolled into how, um, how, how school in, uh, is being stood up. Um, I only, I didn't get much from the interventionist. I had to ask for meetings once a week for 30 minutes with my daughter. She received uh, in, the class, in, in the school, she would, get, uh, she would go for intervention twice a day, five days a week. I had a request in week eight of homeschooling or distance learning for someone to meet with her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, she, the, the, the models are not really designed um, for her learning style. So thank you very much uh, for organizing this and, and thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we have somebody who wants me to read their statement instead. Um, and it says, my daughter has special needs and distance learning is not working for her. She is frustrated and depressed. We have tried strategies to motivate her both at home and with teachers. Nothing at this time is working and she has asked repeatedly to quit school and has become, begun hurting herself to get us to recognize that she cannot climb the hill we have put in front of her. We have moved to Reading and we're willing to pay the taxes because of the school system. This has been taken away and I'm not willing to continue to pay the same in taxes if in essence I have to homeschool. Um, wants to make sure that special ed is heard. Um, loud and clear. I also have a child with um, intellectual disabilities. He's no longer in the school system, but yes. And um, unless, I don't know if the person is on, but one of the people um, wanted to make the comment that they are very concerned that if these these issue these these guidelines are put in place in school and their child with special needs literally can't wear a mask and she's forced to pull them out and homeschool she'll lose her IEP. So there's a lot of parents of special ed kids that are extremely worried about that. Um, Derek just wanted to remind everybody to raise your hand virtually on the chat if you want to be called on. Um, so please do that. And um, the next person is Robin Buzzy or Busey, either one, I'm so sorry. Hi, Robin. Up, <laughs> oh, you're still on mute. Hold on one second. Derek, there you go. Hi, uh, my name's Tom Buzzy. My wife is Robin. Uh, oh, okay. No, I wanna thank you very much for this forum. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a great way to get the, get the word out there for our parents. I live in New Hartford. I'm, in the, uh, I'm on the Board of Ed in New Hartford School District, and I'm on the uh, school opening committee as well. Um, I just want to say I think Amanda touched on all the great points to start the whole, whole conversation off today. Uh, the busing, the logistics are crazy. I think we're going to get these kids into those schools and out again by the time that happens. It'll be lunchtime. You know, turn around and start the whole process again. Uh, makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the masks, I can't see these kids wearing masks during school. My son won't do it. He's going to go into fifth grade. He has no desire to wear a mask, and I, would think, I don't think I'll get one on him anyway. Um, I want to tell a story about a, a parent who approached me last week about the social distancing issue. We've had these parades for um, people who have uh, parties, birthday parties. So instead of going to a birthday party, they get in their cars and they drive by the house and wave. And at the end of this, this particular one, they actually had a uh, ice cream truck. 
So all the kids got out of the car finally. And normally, we would all know the kids would run to the ice cream truck and get in line and mm -hmm. jump and say what you're going to get. These kids got out of their cars and were terrified to leave their parents' side. They are terrified to go near another child. Um, They're holding their parents' hand. The parents were holding on to them. It was a, she told me, it was a very upsetting situation. And that's just one of the examples of what we're doing to these kids with the, the fear we're instilling in them. And the social distancing that we, if we make them go to school and maintain the social distancing issue, it's gonna get in further ingrained in them. And the damage, I don't even know what the damage would be. Uh, that needs to be taken into account as a man that already expressed. Um, and this working issue, as far as teachers, you know, teachers have kids too. So if we're gonna go to school twice a week, what are the teachers gonna do? They have children. You know, they have to make a living. So they, it, the whole situation is so complicated. We want to think uh, of how to undo that now. So I, I also mentioned in, um, I'm going to mention in my opening class, in my uh, reopening committee uh, conversation, I mentioned once about video auditing a class. If a parent doesn't feel safe in bringing their, or putting their child back in a normal school setting, and I'm not going to say new normal, I'm saying normal. In a normal school setting, they should have the option to video audit the class. Their child can stay home if they choose, and video audit the entire class and, and participate that way until at some point in time that they feel safe to enter the class. That way we're not going to the lowest common denominator in these schools. If there's a, if there's a majority of people who want to go to school, they should be allowed to go to school. And if there's people who don't feel safe sending their child to school, that's fine. Video audit the class. They can participate that way. There's live back and forth communication. We're, or we're all seeing that now, and that should be an option on the table not going to the lowest common denominator and keep everyone home. So that's all I want to say and thank you very much. Thanks, Tom, and, and, and thanks for representing a Board of Ed. I think that's really important too. So thank you very much. Um, the next person is Christina Noel. Hi, um, I think I'm probably the odd man out in this situation. Um, I have a child that has um, underlying conditions and is immunocompromised. Um, and I feel like those kids are getting forgotten in this conversation. They still have the same right to be in schools. And the prior person that just spoke, I do appreciate the allowing them to possibly video into class um, but with a student that is rising to be a junior in high school, we are very limited with our options for if I were to remove her and homeschool her, what would be recognized if she chose to return to school and it was safe for her to return to school her senior year. Um, part of the problem is, um, that some, that a public online option is not available in the state of Connecticut. Um, so you are, those that are recognized by the districts and the Board of Education in the state of Connecticut are very limited and they're very expensive. Um, there, I have been given links to additional information on homeschooling and I will go that route if necessary. Um, but my child has been in public school since she was in kindergarten. Um, she's a very intelligent student, um, has done fairly well with the distance learning. There's been some technical hiccups that our district has worked out, um, but that wasn't just her, that was overall. Um, but I appreciate the students with special needs that do need that one-on-one. -on -one situation um, and that they do need and the younger students that need younger that the younger students that need that in-person um, and connective moments with their teacher because those are not recreatable um, outside of that unless teachers are doing full day zoom classes and things like that um, so students are missing out on that but we need to make sure that we're and I understand not wanting to 
go to the lowest common denominator, but we need to make sure that we're understanding and being conscious of all the types of students that we service in our state. Um, my daughter is not the only one. Um, there are actually a group of us that um, are in the same district that <laughs> um, have kind of gotten to know one another. And one of her friends is actually um, going to be a senior next year and is trying to figure out what her options are. Um, so I just don't want those students to be forgotten. Christina, first, I'm just going to ask you, what district are you in? I am um, in, in Hebron. It's a regional district. Um, we're regional district eight. Okay. And can I ask you, have you gotten communication from your district? We have. We've actually gotten a fair amount of um, communication from our district. Excuse me. Um, I've had multiple conversations with my daughter's guidance counselor as well. Um, they're still attempting to go through um, and try to figure out how to make um, the schedules for the fall. Um, they're going as if we're going back to school with no um, types of things. They've asked any students that do have issues um, to reach out to their physicians and find out what would be needed um, to, in order, to achieve the safest um, possibility for them. Um, but overall communication has been very good in our district. Um, we have, um, the first week was a little rough, but we kind of anticipated that. Um, but since then, it has gone very well. Um, teachers have been attempting to give an outline um, to students ahead of time. Um, they made sure that they did the they created reviews for students that were in AP classes um, and offered addition, have offered additional support and given time for conferences. Um, they've allowed certain after school programs to continue. Um, so I think in that respect, in that regard, our district has done well. Um, and um, I don't have a firsthand account, but I, for the elementary schools are kindergarten through sixth graders, but I know that the middle school and high school have communicated abundantly and made sure that they were very clear about what was going on as it, to the extent they can. Christina, I, I do want to say also, you are the reason this group was formed because it is about everybody's voice and respecting everybody's situation. And I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you for, for speaking because it's important to hear from everybody. And I am committed to that as is Denise. I appreciate that. I really do. <laughs> um, okay. Next is Dina Grant. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Am I? Yep. Okay. Hi. Um, and thank you, Christine. Um, it, it is important because I, I, I'm echoing what uh, other people have said already, and it's just important to remind me as well that there are so many people going through so many different experiences, um, and not just me in my head with my own my own worries. Um, I I'm, I'm mostly uh, echoing what what other people have said. I ha I have three children. Um, I have a high school son who prior to this was an A B student and has now. Uh, moved into a C student. Um, and that's primarily, I think, because he used to get daily organizational skills, executive functioning skills. And basically, without that support, he is just not, he, he can't seem to keep up, he can't seem to stay organized. Um, coupled with that is the depression that is has clearly followed from the isolation. And just to give an example, um, he spends a lot of his evening uh, doing Minecraft um, with what are called non IRL friends. Um, learning this terminology, and um, something went wrong with Minecraft, and he, he, he's, a, he's a teenager, he, and he fell apart like nobody's business, and I felt so bad because I had nothing to offer him by way of any social, I couldn't go say, tomorrow you'll be in school and you'll talk to IRL people, it just, and, and so I see the depression, and I see the depression at night, and it's really, it's really hard to feel that my um, hands are tied. Um, I have another daughter who's in fifth grade, and she um, and she has ADD, so she is she's basically 
not following the math at all. And, and because I'm working full time, I'm basically hiding in my basement. Um, and so I, and I, I know that she's missing it. I know that she's probably playing Roblox um, and not listening. Um, but again, I, I, you know, I can run up and say stop, but that's the most I can do. And I feel very, very, you know, very frustrated um, about that. Um, and then finally, I have a five-year-old, and um, he's a five-year-old, so there's not much to say. He he was under the table for the first part of virtual learning, and then I, I had to give up. And um, and and I hate to say it, he's on YouTube most of the day because again, I'm I'm hiding from him a, a good portion of the day, um, and I feel terrible. Um, and so um, I guess I, I you know, I. There are so many things to consider about how to reopen, um, but some degree of reopening, some degree of socialization, some degree of one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction, um, I, I think would have reverberating long-term effects um, to hopefully quell what's been going on uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you. Dina, what district? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, West Hartford. West Hartford. And communication or no? Um, we do get communication from the superintendent. Um, although he, he basically, he seems a little excited about all of this. Um, and he's, he, he says anything could be next year. Absolutely anything. Um, so that, 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 I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I've heard. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, up next is Elizabeth Buckner. Can you hear me now? Yep. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Kathleen, I appreciate you taking all of our concerns and comments up to Governor Mont. Um, <clears throat> so I'm in the New Canaan Public School District. I have two kids there. Uh, I have an autism son and a learning disabled daughter. And I all happen to be a school nurse. So I hear everyone's concerns and I hear everyone's um, on, on both ends of the spectrum. And I truly believe that um, we can formulate a plan to open and it can be successful. I think we're going to have to allow for a lot of out of the box thinking. And I think that we do have to keep our med medically fragile children in mind. I'm a nurse in a K through four school and the conversations that I'm having that I can't obviously disclose those conversations, but a lot of it revolves around, you know, non-engagement of students, anxiety, home issues, domestic issues all because of in this constant um, heightened um, stress zone. And I think we can make it work. I think some of my concerns are with the CDC recommendations as we were all meeting as nurses together, kind of saying, what are you asking us to do with these children? And I think my, you know, what I'd love to know is if we can get the CDC to go back to the table and really look at data, scientific data, and they can change their mind because they do. I also work in a hospital. I work with COVID patients. I'm an EMS. I wear many, many different hats. So I know that the CDC can probably go back and maybe look at some fabulous data coming from all over the world. And yes, children are vessels for infection. I deal with it all the time. However, this virus has not been studied to the same extent as other viruses. So I would love to see a hybrid program which allows our medically fragile kids to be involved in a, maybe an e-learning situation and our children to be in school where that socialization, that teacher-student um, connection can be made. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. The one question, uh, communication from your school district. Um, it's, it's, limited I, I get it on the back end so I, I hear things on the back and the back end so I'm got know. it got it um, thank you um, next is Sherry Pauline hi can you hear me <laughs> yeah you can speak a little louder okay I'll talk there you go. sorry um, thank you I'm from district ER 9 we're from Easton and uh, like literally 10 minutes before this meeting got an email from the school system, it basically just said that they have formed a task force. Most of the paragraphs were about safety and PPE, and so I didn't really read it. I didn't, there was no like definitive, but there was some notification. Um, I, 
I think I'm learning as I'm listening to others as well. One thing that seems very clear, which I didn't think of before because I, I don't have any experience with it, but is that a separate task force should be formed for special needs, any type of special need. That is very clear because for every child that has um, some type of immunodeficiency or you know might be immune compromised, there's a child who might have anxiety of wearing a mask. So there really has to be, I, that is very hard, totally understand that. And I really feel like there has to be a separate task force that really focuses on all of those needs for the parents with those concerns. And it's really good for me to come to this meeting to understand that because I don't have that perspective. Um, now, that said, I still firmly believe in offering two options. I think it's long overdue that there's been a proper distance learning program for snow days. I think it's actually atrocious that we don't have one. And we need to have a good distance learning program that could be used for people who wanna use that full time, for people who are playing it right and keeping their kids home when they have a sniffle, um, could also join in. Um, it would encourage that. And I really feel that the main concern is, is from the teachers in the schools that this is hard. And I think I've heard that, of course, and I truly believe that I think someone just said this, we can do it. These task forces, how many people would volunteer? You're looking at all these people that are volunteering their time. I work full time, I own a business, and I'm dedicating my time to this. And there are lots of parents that would dedicate some portion of their time, potentially even to distance learning. We have to think outside the box, like somebody just said, it's, it's crucial. Regarding the buses, I'm dedicating an entire day to my kids homeschooling. I think I can dedicate time to drop them off at school. I think I prefer that. Not a big deal at all. That's pretty much all I have to say because I don't want to monopolize the time. So I appreciate the opportunity and can't wait to hear the continued um, you know, learning from everyone else on the call. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, we have another um, person, it's, they want to remain anonymous, so I'm going to read it. Um, the CDC guidelines for mask PPE that were released back in March were way too loose, but realistic to the available supply. The CDC received great backlash from the medical community, including myself. I feel that the guidelines for return to school are very strict to avoid that backlash. The guidelines are so strict, however, that they are probably unattainable. There are so many issues at play here, from special ed to health concerns, to gifted and advanced academic support and AP class instruction. I would ask for a return to school, but with flexibility to accommodate diverse needs. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just trying to see, I know I had another person who wanted me to read something. Uh, hold on, Derek, do I have anybody else? No. Is there anybody else we have missed here? I think that's it. Um, I, I, I would, Denise, I'm trying to think if there's anything that was in our questions and I'm just trying to look. People had sent me questions ahead of time, so just bear with me one question. Um, I'm getting texts left and right. Oh, hang on, more people. <laughs> it's coming in. Um, I, I, um, I will bring up a point myself that was kind of an aha moment for me, um, was getting back to costs again. Um, if masks are required, then that would mean that schools have to supply them. And if schools have to supply them, what is the cost to the individual school district again, i.e. bankruptcy? Um, so that's, I guess, a point I wanted to make about that. Um, Samantha Padrignelli, I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name wrong. Samantha, that's okay. Name. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm in Fairfield. Okay. I have a kindergartner. And um, we do get communication from Cummings. I think he's new, he's wonderful. Um, last I heard were three options, um, a hybrid option, a distance learning option, and an in-person option, but nothing specific yet. Um, I wanted to talk about the screens, screen time, and I would love a pediatrician's view on our pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade are really young learners, and being on screen for 
an extended period of time. Um, I've seen a change in my own daughter as a kindergartner um, in her attitude, in her sleep, um, her behavior just in general from sitting on a computer at an extended period of time. And it's just not a sustainable way for a young child to learn. I am also an educator. I teach pre-K in, in Bridgeport. And it's just something to consider. Um, if there is a pediatrician in this group, I would love for them to chime in and um, talk about that. If not, then I think a letter should be written, a statement made by a pediatrician to support us. Um. Thank you. And you know what, I think that's a, a really good point. And if there is a pediatrician, if they could um, raise their hand, that would be great. And if not, um, my other, one of my two real jobs is as CEO of a nonprofit called First Candle. Um, we are committed to ending sudden unexpected infant deaths. Um, and we have a number of pediatricians on our board. My first child died of SIDS of 1997. Um, so that's how I got involved in a lot of infant child safety. Um, but so yes, I think that's a very good point and we will reach out to pediatricians. Um, Julie Nash is next. I think you're on Julie. Hi all, sorry about that. I'm on now? Okay. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Julie Nash. I am from uh, Milford, the school district of Milford, and we've had a lot of communication, and my kids actually enjoy the virtual learning, so I'm coming from a slightly different place. Um, and, and again, let me just start off when I should have said thank you for organizing this and Representative McCarty for joining us, but what I'd like to um, for you to bring back to the powers that be um, is from a working parent. Um, and how the school will align with working parents and changing the workplace culture along with the expectations of the school. I think that that's a bigger issue. One of the frustrations I keep having and a lot of my working um, parents keep having is that, you know, um, schools are out, but work went back May 20th. Um, so everyone was scrambling. It's, camps don't open until June 22nd. Well, then work should not have opened until June 22nd. Um, you know, working moms like us, we fought um, quite hard to get that face time and become executives and high level executives. And we're losing a lot of the face time because let's face it, uh, you know, moms are the ones that take care of a lot of this stuff. So we're going to lose ground um, in, in this if we don't align schools with work. Um, I think for many, many years, the, the school day um, has not aligned. It should have been a, a nine to five work school day anyway. Um, to go along with, with work, with the traditional work day. Um, school should start later. It shouldn't start as early. So I think there's a lot of things we can take advantage of, positive changes that will help the um, workforce in America, along with um, whatever decisions the school chain decides to go with. I just think that those two things have to be aligned. Um, I don't expect government to have all the answers or to provide all the answers or funding. I've been talking to my working moms about creating, um, you know, like five of five kids go one day to one house, five go another day to another house. So we're not having those extreme costs um, for childcare. But one of the things I do think government might be able to offer is to incentivize private um, offices and municipalities to open up child and daycares um, at their uh, offices. And maybe they can do that in the incentive this they can incentivize that with a tax credit um, in some shape or form. So it's not a direct cash uh, payment, but that they incentivize having their workers um, being able to bring your kids to work on the days that they're not in school. I mean, that again, that's something that really should have been done many, many years ago. So if we can make these changes now to go along with this, I think that's gonna be a great win-win for a lot of us working parents going forward. But thank you again all for, for putting this together and listening to my thoughts. Thank you, Julie, and, and you're right. I mean, I think that's what we're looking for all is win-win. Um, I have a couple others I need to read. A couple people couldn't get on. This is from Laura Tucker in Westport. CDC recommendations are outrageous. My husband's family lives in Australia. Their schools opened May 25th. My son sent me the hygiene from the state live in. New are dual. They are using 
different medical research to guide them. They are going five days a week, normal schedule, not staggered. Kids don't need to distance as preliminary studies have shown they are not major spreaders. Teachers need to keep distance from each other. Good hygiene measures, lots of cleaning, bring on water bottles, etc. No kid goes to school if the slightest bit unwell and to get tested. Also, any kid with a phone should download the COVID app we have to trace spread. Australian government has an amazing app that everyone in the country is supposed to download to keep them up to date on COVID info, contact tracing, et cetera. No sharing food or drink. Parents are not allowed on school grounds. Daily temperature checks when the kids arrive. No school assemblies, no team sports just yet. All going well, kids sports training restarts July 1st. In the classroom, kids do not need to distance from one another. And then she said also her friend is a teacher and she wanted me to comment for her. My main concern um, is if they split classes half Monday, Wednesday, and then the other half Tuesday, Thursday, what happens with the kids the days they're off? Online school or will parents have to foot childcare that they haven't budgeted for? Also six feet apart per child in a classroom will not be physically possible. The facilities don't have the capacity. A preschool director in New Canaan surveyed daycares in Connecticut that stayed open and results were that there was no transmission in any of the 93 responding programs. Um, okay, um, the next is Stephanie Ducharme. I'm so sorry again if I'm saying your name wrong. Can you, can, can you hear me? Yep. Right. Oh, yeah, this is my first time. Totally new. Um, my daughter goes to Brantford and she's going to be going into fifth grade. And this whole distance learning has just been a complete mess for us. Um, she's a hot mess, but luckily I'm in contact with the school social worker. So they've been a lot of help. And at first, uh, they were a little slow on the go to get the distance learning going, and she was participating. But after probably like a good three-ish weeks, it just was be creating so much chaos that I kind of put a kibosh to the whole thing because it was just causing too much chaos in the house. And I'm still encouraging her to do the work, and she's still getting work done, but it just was not a good fit for us. Um, and she misses her, her school. She misses her friends. Um, and she had a little bit of a rough year before all of this happened and was, you know, kind of getting made fun of. And honestly, she misses that at this point because she so badly wants to be around other kids. And it just breaks my heart. Um, but, you know, I'm super worried. I think a lot of the guidelines just aren't realistic. And it's not that I don't want to be flexible, but I mean, I'm low income and I can guarantee that my bosses and people with similar jobs like me, our employers aren't going to be flexible with this flex schedule that's kind of being thrown around. And I, I just don't know how we're going to pull it off. I would almost be better off pulling her out of school and getting a job at night so that I can make sure I am fully focused on the education and still bringing in a paycheck. And I do think that homeschooling is much different than what we're doing right now. And I would try to get into some kind of community, but I would much rather her just go back to school the way it was. I mean, I understand we have to be safe and we have to clean and I'm all for that. Um, I am immunocompromised. So I, you know, am worried about what she may or may not bring home, but I want my kid to be happy again. Um, I want her to be able to be around people. And, um, you know, I just, I just think the guidelines are just super unrealistic. And I am worried that if we do kind of move forward with all this and a lot of those guidelines are implemented, I mean, there's some policies, I think maybe for camp or something going around, where the kids now can't come back to school for 72 hours if they have a fever, which that's not the end of the world, but I would hate for her to just have a cold at school and then I can't send her back for two weeks. I'm worried about how that's going to be determined and who's going to be determining it. I mean, am I gonna be allowed to have my pediatrician do it? Is it gonna be up to the school nurse? I, I'm just 
kind of worried about that. And then even just with the daily temperatures, um, although I understand it's a good, you know, preventative or I don't know, just to keep track of things. I mean, we could easily just give the kids Tylenol and send them. I'm just scared sending her to school. And it's like, like not, I don't, not boot camp, but it, you know, it's so strict. They're going to have all these requirements and rules and are the other kids, parents, you know, cause all of our kids hear us talk. So all of our kids are going to come in and repeat whatever we're saying in the home. And I, I'm just, I'm just overall worried about the whole thing. Um, my daughter's school has, like I said, I've been in contact with them. They do me, I want to say they do a Google classroom, the whole class a couple times a week. And then they do smaller groups because they found that some of the kids were getting nervous being with the whole class. Um, but I had to pull her out of that because once again, it, it was just causing too much. Um, I think it would be different, like I said, if I was in charge of the curriculum that she has, because now it's kind of like, oh, well, the teacher wants me to do this, mom. So, you know, that would be something I'd have to address. But if the, the, if the CDC guidelines get pushed, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely pulling her out. And that's just really, I'm just worried. I'm very worried about the whole thing. So, you know, I'm hoping that there could be flexibility with those guidelines. I just, I just think they're unrealistic. And I think a lot of parents' jobs are going to be affected. And I think um, finances are going to be affected. And I just, I just think it's going to be too hard to meet that. So, you know, I'm hoping that if there's some place parents can contact so that we can get our voices heard, we can do that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just super worried about the whole thing. Well, and for anybody who hasn't filled in our survey monkey, that's in our announcements too in the Facebook group, please do that because that will have an impact. We've got great questions there and we can show the impact of that. So please fill out the survey monkey if you haven't. Um, somebody does want to speak. They want to remain anonymous though. So Derek, if you could put on anonymous. Hi, Allison. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. First, I would like to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for organizing this and for having this uh, group get together and share our concerns. Um, and for Representative joining us. Um, I live in Oline. I'm in part of the Region 18 school district. Um, it's a... Um, an impressive school district to say the least in terms of their communication and at times actually they may have over communicated um, where it was quite overwhelming um, and very similar to everybody else um, you know in the beginning it was a hard turn to try to get up to speed on distance learning um, but then over time they kind of got their sea legs under them I have two boys they both are 504 um, plans and both 504 plans so to speak were dropped um, because they can't you know, there's no more meetings regarding the 504. Um, there's really no way to enact the 504 um, through um, distance learning. One of my, um, in the beginning, um, my younger son who's in sixth grade, um, you know, was exceptional in terms of um, his own motivation. And I, because he had some speech delays and he had hypotomia and other things uh, as he was younger with uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy, he's always been on a very structured plan so I think that that kind of helped us as we migrated to distance learning in terms of structure and staying structured as much as possible um, but to those other moms that are out there um, working full-time um, you know I was furloughed and um, it was a you know if I were not furloughed I think it would have been exceptionally more difficult to do and to for me to pivot um, but one of the things that I've noticed that is really just um, and I'm probably gonna get emotional that's really bothering me is since the beginning of May I can see a, a significant difference in my in, the, in their mental health um, that's what's really worrying me is their mental health the depression their affinity to have to be um, online at a certain time at night when their other friends are on because it's the only time that they have that connection. Um, and God forbid there is some sort of disagreement between the kids. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's almost terrifying because the entire, they, their entire world now is existing on this small amount of time that they can get their other friends online to have a conversation. And if there is some sort of disagreement where they went to school the next day, like boys or, or typical kids, they would have worked it out. It would have been worked out. It's not a big deal. We all move on. But in this situation, there are legacy issues, and there's no way for them to repair this as children online and to in, in not engaging each other and, you know, just kind of like moving on. You know, you throw a basketball and you just move on to that point in terms of not having any sort of competitive sports. They, they need to be physical. They need to have some sort of outlet. My boys are lacrosse and basketball. And they, they, they absolutely are competitive and they love that sense. And it gives them a sense of stress relief right now that they need. I'm exceptionally pleased with my school district. I'm, you know, there are some things I wish we could have done differently. Um, for example, I know that they swapped out some of the literature um, because it was easier to teach a particular book versus another per book. But I'm not going to, you know, that's not, that's not a big deal. For all intents and purposes, I am exceptionally proud of my school district and what they've done. Um, I'm just more speaking in terms of, you know, for the state and for all children. I, there is exceptionally uh, difficult things going on in the world and that they need to be with other children. They, 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 they need to not always be parenting or be parented. They need other children. And so... Um, I guess I don't want to waste everybody's time. I just wanted to share that from the bottom of my heart that I'm very worried about how they are in terms of their mental capacity. Thank you for your time, Allison. Thank you so much. Um, there's somebody who's having computer problems, Barbara. She said she's missed some of the session. Could you please relay that my son struggles with masks and he struggles with reading people's facial expressions when they wear a mask? This makes it difficult. I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't see that now. Um, sorry. This makes it difficult and increases anxiety. Distance learning is too challenging, but I agree that it is helpful to have several ideas. Hope you get this message. Yes, we did get your message. Um, next is uh, Margaret Coden, C-O-D-A-N, Margaret Coden. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, speak a little louder. Okay, great. So my name is Margaret. I am from Fairfield, Connecticut, and I have three kids who are in second grade preschool, and I have a four-month-old baby. I'm going to leave the decision as to whether we should reopen the schools to the health professionals and educators. I just wanted to comment on the distance learning, um, as I feel like there should be a radical departure from what it's been like today for at least for the K through five community. So my seven-year-old, she's very resistant to the distance learning. She's sensitive. If I correct a problem, she'll start crying, go to the top of her bunk bed, and that'll derail us for two hours. Um, and she's very easily distracted. And so it's very hard to get through even one assignment. Also, my husband and I spent, you know, seven years um, trying not to have our children be on screens. They didn't own an iPad. They didn't have a cell phone. Um, so it's been a huge learning curve in terms of teaching her how to be computer literate. So even though she's my oldest and would other, otherwise be very independent, I am spending, you know, six hours a day with her, sitting next to her, A, trying to motivate her, and B, downloading, uploading documents and pictures um, to help her complete her assignments. In the meantime, I have my two little ones in the same room with us because they have to be attended to and they're completely distracting the one child I need to get to for her to do her assignments. So every day um, there's lots of tears and um, it's just not sustainable. And I talk, I, I know I don't have a special ed child or I don't have an immunocompromised, I, I'm so sensitive to everyone. I feel like I don't even have a bad story compared to everyone who's spoken so far. Um, but I do feel like for the younger children, there has to be a radical departure from um, Google Classroom that's being used for them today. So I was trying to think of, I have lots of comments for the teachers and how they can improve it, but in terms of um, 
the state, uh, I was trying to think of things that the state could do. Um, I was thinking maybe just, I know we have curriculum requirements. And so when I complain to the teachers about the number of assignments, they just come back to me that this is the Connecticut guidelines. This is, and this is what we need to get accomplished. And so she has six assignments a day and we, can, we can't even get through one. So um, maybe for the next year, maybe there can be, you know, a lessening of the curriculum requ requirements, at least for the younger kids. In my opinion, 30 minutes of reading, some math worksheets, maybe one other subject a day would be plenty for a seven-year-old. Our district is also requiring us to do all the specials, and a seven-year-old naturally, you know, runs around and plays music and dances and reads and does artwork all the time. And so I think the specials can certainly be optional at this point. Um, I've also thought about um, rather than just dis doing distance learning, I know some of the rest of the state's been thinking, um, the rest of the country has been thinking about this. And I know this is controversial and would need to be um, brainstormed and thought out, but should we change the school year? And so should we be doing full year school year so we can start school in August, for example, and if we need to take a COVID school break or a flu COVID season break, maybe our break is January to March and we kind of go through school longer into the year um, and they don't have distance learning then, they actually have off. Um, and then for the little kids, I'm not even sure a computer is necessary. That's when the technology came out, Fairfield was considered state-of-the-art. Our, our teachers did an amazing job and administrators of putting together this Google Classroom. My, my sister's a third grade teacher and I sent her a picture of what they had done and she thought it was remarkable too. But a lot of times the technology looks amazing on paper and then once you, you try to execute on it, it doesn't look so great. So I almost am I'm begging for a kind of pen and paper workbooks and sheets like in the olden days. Um, and if we do go to a staggered kind of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, live school, Tuesday, Thursday, distance learning next year, um, I would suggest on the days that the younger children don't have school that it's more of 30 minutes of reading or once or twice a week you cook and bake with your child and you have them read recipes and measure ingredients and sequence the steps or once once or twice a week you are in the garden or you take a walk and you teach them about pollination or maybe you create a list of chores and you set timelines and frequencies and you teach them how to do laundry and um, how to make their bed and you learn and you teach them to tell time and how to measure things, just normal life lessons um, for these little kids so that they don't have to be in front of a computer or even sitting down for a long period of time working on sheets. Um, so that, that's my first concern. My second one is my preschooler is gonna be attending kindergarten next year, which um, remotely makes me very nervous. I almost wanna pull her and not send her to kindergarten if there's no in-person school. I'm not sure how she's gonna learn to read on a computer or how she's gonna get used to being in a big school or how she's gonna be get used to making friends. Um, so that's another big concern of mine. Um, I think that's all I had. I just wanted Allison to thank you so much for holding the meeting and Kathleen for um, listening from a state perspective. And I'm hoping that there just can be some major changes to the distance learning next year if we need to have it. Thank you. Uh, next up is Laura Triones. Hi, Allison. Yep. Hi, hi, thank you so much for hosting this outstanding um, opportunity to share ideas. And um, Kathleen, thank you for coming. I am in the Fairfield School District and I, we've had consistent communication. Mike, Mike Cummings, again, someone mentioned he's new. He's been great. I guess my concern was that if we wait too long, the notice that we get about what will happen in the fall will come out last minute. A lot of the communication that we received, you know, when this first started was, you know, we're going to go toward to the end of the week. And then like, they were like, oh, it changed. We're going to end school tomorrow. So the idea that things happen that quickly seems so responsive. And so making sure that when we look at what's going to happen for the kids next year, that it's not something that's a last minute response, but something that's a really well thought out plan. 
I have a freshman and a junior currently. You know, I'm really blessed. My kids are good students, and so they are um, able to stick with school. My challenge is that um, they're often done with school at 11 or 12 o'clock because they are diligent, and there's a lot of busy work for them. Um, my daughter had two, like amazing teachers this year, and it was a shame that she missed a quarter of the year with these outstanding teachers and they did the best they could moving online. And I, I think that not enough can be said about our teachers and how quickly they transitioned. It's just the nature, you know, I'm an executive coach by, by training and the nature of adults being able to pay attention online, our average attention span is 15 to 20 minutes. So what is that for a child? And we're looking at having these kids sit in front of computers from, you know, nine to two and, you know, are they really getting the education that they need to, to be competitive? I mean, we're talking about my daughter's going to be a senior next year and she's got to go and compete her AP exams instead of being the three hours long and really putting in the entire, what they've learned the entire year. It was one question and one hour long. And so that was AP exams. And so, you know, I think that it really, they missed out on the opportunity to show off really what they've learned the entire year, but also it was such a hard, um, atmosphere to test in. So, it, you know, it's like, what is the right thing to do? I'm not sure, but online learning the way it's currently operating isn't the answer. Um, you know, and I agree with the parents who have said the CDC guidelines, um, they really do seem like they don't want the kids back in school. Um, I, I, I understand that there has to be guidelines, but things like, okay, you have to have kids every other seat on a bus, which limits the number of kids on the bus. Well, I thought if we wore masks, then we could be closer than six feet apart. And does that allow us to at least put one kid in every seat. You know, that someone had mentioned thinking outside of the box. I think that that really is the key for what can we do to get our kids back in school safely. Um, I know one of the thoughts I had was about looking at real numbers and science and creating a plan where, you know, if our COVID numbers are X, then we go back to school as regular with necessary precautions. If the COVID cases are, you know, like an X2 or grows to X2, then you consider a hybrid of online learning um, and in person. And then if it gets to X3 or greater, then you go to online learning as a final alternative. Based on hearing the conversations, it's clear that there are some kids who won't be able to go back to school and maybe having that ability to videotape um, classes as they're going on for those students is, an, is a way to kind of bridge the gap for kids who aren't comfortable going back. Um, but that we're not looking at like there's one answer, either we go back or we don't go back. Because if we have a spike in the fall, I think we need to be prepared for that as well. So I, again, I think that this idea of throwing out lots of different options so that we can create a plan that will not only take us into the fall, but should we also have a spike, gives us a roadmap to follow. Thank you yeah, so much for listening. My pleasure, and thank you. I, you know, one of the things that struck me, I have a um, graduating senior, and it seems like most of the colleges are planning on ending at that Thanksgiving break, and they're all going to leave and not come back to spring semester, specifically for that reason. Let's mm -hmm. get them out at that time, and I'm, I'm kind of struck that 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 hasn't been considered or isn't being considered yet, or maybe it is, but I, I think that's a, a thing as well. Um, um, I, Denise, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I am going to put you on the spot. You know, the, we're, we're having sidebar conversations, and I would open it up to this group um, for a little bit of a brainstorm right now about creative ideas for e-learning, and, and I wanted you to just share a little bit what your, your mom had said or what you were thinking about it, too. Well, yeah, I, my mom is a uh, nursing professor at um, NCC. And it was a little bit difficult because um, they do a lot of their, what they call simulations in the hospital. And obviously that was not even remotely going to happen. But one of the things that she did for her lectures is that she actually went on Zoom and taught her curriculum, um, it, which is something I think is very, it's very doable to be able to do that. Um, it, instead of having like for us in Norwalk, it was um, a hodgepodge. We had 
the kids getting PDFs, they would just kind of work on their own, send them in. If they had a question, it might have taken a day or two to get back to their teachers. But the way that she did it, and I observed her, was that she was actually engaged with her students, similar to the format that we're on now. So people could ask questions. You could see each other uh, in, you know, on the, on the computer. And the lessons were actually taught. And if there were questions, it, it, it was the same thing. You could type, you could do all of that. Whereas I feel like a lot of the, um, the board of education, depending on the district, just kind of did their own thing. So people's experiences were vastly different. Uh, and even, again, what so many people have, have mentioned is, is how kids learn and are they learning and is, is this an option? I can tell you that my son um, has always struggled. He's IEP. Uh, the whole, he got none of that in March. We didn't even get his updated um, uh, recommendations. Uh, he's now failing three classes. So he went from a B average, a steady B average to failing a few classes. My girls are AP students, so it was a little bit different for them. Uh, but that said, they were both done very early. And I, I don't see why if you're going to have to do some type of distance learning that it can't be a Zoom class. If, if school is with different teachers from 7.30 in the morning till two o'clock, then that's what school should be. I don't feel that cutting the hours is uh, you know, necessarily the right thing to do. And I also agree with the parents as far as you know, the, the, the onus has really, of uh, responsibility has really fallen on the parents with, with uh, the online learning, the distance learning. Um, and I know for myself, I've not been able to help my children with math since mm, the sixth grade. You know, and I'm in finance, so you know, it's 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 really really hard. And I think that I think what's encouraging is I I think that we really have the same concerns. And I think that uh, you know when we talk about the cost of masks and busing and plastic and <laughs> partitions, it, it really um, as other people have said, it's very unrealistic, budget wise. Um, I don't know what implementing a Zoom-like situation in a live classroom would cost. I don't know anything about that. I'm certainly, I'm sure there are people that are much better versed in that area than I am. But uh, it, the bottom line is that as much as I would like to go back to school, I want, I want it to be normal, not the new normal, just plain old school. And I don't know that that's realistic. Um, the one thing that I did want to actually discuss quickly was physical activity sports. I think that that, you know, it seems so insignificant when we're talking about children with disabilities and we're talking about working parents, but it is, it's a huge impact. And what I would like the state to consider is that the decisions that they are making today are going to affect these kids long after coronavirus is gone. Um, and I think that that needs to be kept in mind. I think that they need to also keep in mind that a lot of other states are not facing the same issues that we are. They're opening, they're done, they're not social distancing, they're back to normal. Those kids are going back to normal and our children are gonna be the ones competing against these kids for placement in college especially for the kids that are going in and being seniors, they're gonna be competing against those kids. I, my children have not even taken an SAT. I have a, a child that's being actively recruited by university for sports. I'm not even sure she's gonna be able to play sports. I'm not sure if that's gonna, you know, kind of diminish her possibility of going to a school that I would not otherwise be able to afford. So the decisions, they need to be made carefully and they need to be made not only based on science, but they also need to be based on common sense. They need to be based on the fact, like I said, this is going to affect these kids a lot longer than COVID. It, it, this is going to be gone. There'll be a, a vaccine or however it's going to you know, manifest, but this is going to be forever what we do to these kids right now. And, and I just can't stress that enough. Thanks, Denise. Um, Derek, do we have any other questions? Does anybody else have anything? 
Um, please know this isn't the last of it. Uh, hold on. Nope, none. Um, oh, sorry. Alicia. Alicia has another comment. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak again. I know, you know, it's it's hard to speak with so many people here, but after Christina spoke, um, you know, it brought to mind a conversation that I had in the Facebook group about what would make people feel comfortable with getting their children back into school, the, the people who have a health concern for their, for their child. What makes, what would make them comfortable? Is it a vaccine? Is it a medication? Is it the CDC changing their guidelines or saying that the pandemic is over? Um, and as I said before, people do have a very real concern, whether we agree with them or not. Like you said, this group is for everyone's voice to be heard. And if we can understand what would make them feel more comfortable bringing their children back to school, maybe we can help incorporate those things without blowing up our budget. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Alicia, thank you so much for that. Christina, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but, you know, and I, I, I will ask you if you have anything, any thoughts about that. I don't know. Um, I would really, excuse me, I'm sorry. It's thundering here in my dog. Here too. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I know that there's never 100% guarantee about anything. Um, and I know that there are things that she's going to be exposed to in life. Um, I think what is one of my bigger concerns is, is that there is no real outline treatment for patients. And yes, I know that there is a small population that doesn't get to the point of no return and all of that, but not having a, really a, a clear way to treat it, I think is more concerning. Um, if there was maybe a treatment or something that, that clearly stopped it be before it became something that would cause death or um, something that's that's preventing some of the the life-altering conditions that some people are suffering after having had and experienced this virus. Um, I think maybe that's where my concerns lie, and maybe if there was something that mitigated that, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable sending her to school. Um, just with the the way that her, with the way her system is, it's something she's going to have to deal with for her entire life. Um, so I don't necessarily want to have a situation where she has to deal with another life-altering illness or situation. Um, and she's been very, she's been very, she's very understanding. Um, she's very minimally, um, gotten involved in, you know, going anywhere. Um, so she's been very cautious. Um, but I do encourage her to read studies and things on her own. Um, and I try to get her feedback as to what, um, she feels safe with. Um, so something that I guess would ease both of our concerns would be where I'd want to go. Um, there was one other comment that I wanted to make, and I did message it. Um, if they, if these students are calling in or having, um, having some way coming in via Zoom, um, would they still be counted as present? Um, what are kind of some of the ramifications of that, I guess, would be a question that I would have. Well, and also that brings up the point of the whole idea of absenteeism. If, if kids are right. going to 
you know, out for two weeks because they have to be out for two weeks. What's that going to do to the 181 days of school or whatever? Well, that and also the state mandated that a student can only be absent X number of okay. days. Each district is either nine or 10. But then after a certain, a certain point, when students are absent, they start losing credit when right. they're in middle school and in high school. So that's a concern as well that can they, if they're feeling, you know, slightly ill and they're supposed to stay home or they're immunocompromised and they need to stay home for their safety or a family situation, because I know it's not just students that have it. Sometimes parents are concerned that the student's going to bring something home to the family, which I understand as well, or if you have older relatives that live in the house. So there are a lot of things like that. But what but what does it do to those attendance policies how does that then affect a student or is the student that's you know zooming in or google meeting into the cl the live classroom home are they going to be you know viewed as a different type of student are they going to be held to the same standard are they going to be able to still get the same support that a student in school would. So there's a lot of logistical things where, yes, that sounds like a great idea, but are they, are they going to be able to set up times with their teacher for after school help, just like an in-person student? Are they going to be able to go to a writing lab or a math lab if they're having a confusion on that? Are they going to be able to take those, those same exams and what are going to be the protocols for that? Because if we are offering that as an option, especially for the higher grades, so say seventh, seven through 12, we need to figure out what, how, what standards are we holding those students to? Are they going to have the same standard as a student that's in school? Are they going to have the access to the same things, you know, same support system that they do in school? Um, and I know that that's a district by district kind of thing, but at the same time, these are things that we need to think about if we are going to offer that because we want to make sure that we're supporting all of our students, not just group A, B, but we want to make sure that we're getting A through Z. And there's a lot of different pieces that we need to make sure that um, we're touching on and really making sure we're doing what's best for all students and not just absolutely <laughs> absolutely to go to school or however they have to go to school they should have the same access to clubs and support as needed yep a hundred percent um okay i i i'm so happy everybody's been here and thundering and lightning um patricia do you have something that you want to add and uh, nothing. No, I don't have anything to add, but this has just been really great. I think that we have, of, I think that, that we have, a, we have generated a lot of information and I think that it's been great to hear everybody's voice. And I think we're hearing a lot of different voices and I think that's really great. And I think that was the whole purpose to this call. And I would love to see this call more, you know, have it more often because I think it's really important that we express and talk about all these different issues because they're so complex and there's so many different facets and if we don't get people to give their opinions about something that we wouldn't think about we wouldn't be able to sort of formulate um, policies so I just think it's been really great and I I've really enjoyed listening to everybody tonight and uh, I just want to say thank you again for um, creating this call and Kathleen thank you for joining um you've been instrumental as well so thank you as well thank you kathleen i do you have any thoughts or comments can you hear me yep okay great yes i'd just like to add that it was uh we heard some very uh thought-provoking uh, recommendations and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing back again how we can bring this I, I heard some very uh, a lot of common themes coming through tonight and I think it'll be advantageous if we can kind of call those together and uh, bring them back to the state and see where we can move with some of the recommendations we've heard tonight um, you know, I think this pandemic really did heighten 
many of the disparities that exist throughout our uh, educa education system in the state. And it was very much highlighted again this evening here. But I did listen very carefully to what was said and I'm looking forward to the next step. And I thank again, Patricia and uh, Allison and uh, for inviting me here and Denise to come in tonight and listen to all of you. And I look forward to hearing uh, more in the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next step is absolutely, please go in and fill out that survey monkey. Um, the results will go to the media. The results will go to more of the legislature. Somebody asked, is this gonna be getting to um, Governor Lamont's office? It absolutely will. Um, you know, we, we can't, congregate as much as we have been in the peace marches, but um, we can make our voices heard, all our voices, all inclusive. And um, I would ask all of you, please, um, Denise works full time, I work full time. Um, our group has grown and it's fabulous, but man, it's hard to like see every comment. So please help us, please help us keep the spirit of what we did tonight in the group. We can do this, we can, get along and be constructive. And I said, I think it's a lot easier when we now have faces to go with, with names. And, you know, let's, let's just do this. We, can, we are in it for our kids and we can make this right for them. Because as Denise said, this is gonna have long lasting impact. So um, be well, everybody. If you like this, please let everybody know on Facebook how good it was. We are going to record it um, or post it on Facebook. We are going to be doing more of these and um, more to come. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.